Veritatis Splendor, Part 2 Those who live by the flesh experience God's law as a burden, and indeed as a denial, or at least a restriction, of their own freedom. On the other hand, those who are impelled by love and walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, and who desire to serve others, find in God's law the fundamental and necessary way in which to practice love as something freely chosen and freely lived out. Indeed, they feel an interior urge, a genuine necessity and no longer a form of coercion, not to stop at the minimum demands of the law, but to live them in their fullness. This is a still uncertain and fragile journey as long as we are on earth, but it is one made possible by grace, which enables us to possess the full freedom of the children of God, and thus to live our moral life in a way worthy of our sublime vocation as sons in the sun. This vocation to perfect love is not restricted to a small group of individuals. The invitation, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and the promise, you will have treasure in heaven, are meant for everyone, because they bring out the full meaning of the commandment of love for neighbor, just as the invitation which follows, come follow me, is the new, specific form of the commandment of love of God. Both the commandments and Jesus' invitation to the rich young man stand at the service of a single and indivisible charity, which spontaneously tends towards that perfection whose measure is God alone. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48 In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus makes even clearer the meaning of this perfection. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. The way, and at the same time the content of this perfection, consists in the following of Jesus, Sequela Christi, once one has given up one's own wealth and very self. This is precisely the conclusion of Jesus' conversation with the young man. Come, follow me. It is an invitation, the marvelous grandeur of which will be fully perceived by the disciples after Christ's resurrection, when the Holy Spirit leads them all to truth. It is Jesus himself who takes the initiative and calls people to follow him. His call is addressed first to those whom he entrusts a particular mission, beginning with the twelve. But it is also clear that every believer is called to be a follower of Christ. Acts 6 1. Following Christ is thus the essential and primordial foundation of Christian morality. Just as the people of Israel followed God, who led them through the desert towards the Promised Land, so every disciple must follow Jesus, towards whom he is drawn by the Father himself. This is not a matter only of disposing oneself to hear a teaching and obediently accepting a commandment. More radically, it involves holding fast to the very person of Jesus, partaking of his life and his destiny, sharing in his free and loving obedience to the will of the Father, by responding in faith and following the one who is incarnate wisdom, the disciple of Jesus truly becomes a disciple of God. Jesus is indeed the light of the world, the light of life. He is the shepherd who leads his sheep and feeds them. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It is Jesus who leads to the Father, so much sore, so that to see him, the Son, 
is to see the Father, and thus to imitate the Son, the image of the invisible God, means to imitate the Father. Jesus asks us to follow him and to imitate him along the path of love, a love which gives itself completely to the brethren out of love for God. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15:12. The word as requires imitation of Jesus and of his love, of which the washing of feet is a sign. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus' way of acting and his words, his deeds, and his precepts constitute the moral rule of Christian life. Indeed, his actions, and in particular his passion and death on the cross, are the living revelation of his love for the Father and for others. This is exactly the love that Jesus wishes to be imitated by all who follow him. It is the new commandment, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John thirteen thirty four to 35 The word as also indicates the degree of Jesus' love and of the love with which his disciples are called to love one another. After saying, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, Jesus continues with words which indicate the sacrificial gift of his life on the cross, as the witness to a love to an it, to the end. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15.13 As he calls the young man to follow him along the way of perfection, Jesus commands him to be perfect in the command of love, in his commandment, to become part of the unfolding of his complete giving, to imitate and rekindle the very love of the good teacher, the one who loved to the end. This is what Jesus asks of everyone who wishes to follow him. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Following Christ is not an outward imitation, since it touches man at the very depths of his being. Being a follower of Christ means becoming conformed to him who became a servant, even to giving himself on the cross. Christ dwells by faith in the heart of the believer, and thus the disciple is conformed to the Lord. This is the effect of grace, of the active present of the Holy Spirit in us. Having become one with Christ, the Christian becomes a member of his body, which is the church. Corinthians twelve thirteen, twenty seven. By the work of the Spirit, baptism radically configures the faithful to Christ in the paschal mystery of death and resurrection. It clothes him in Christ. Let us rejoice and give thanks, claims St. Augustine, speaking to the baptized, for we have become not only Christians, but Christ. Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. Having died to sin, those who are baptized receive new life, alive for God in Christ Jesus. 
They are called to walk by the Spirit and to manifest the Spirit's fruits in their lives. Sharing in the Eucharist, the sacrament of the New Covenant, is the culmination of our assimilation to Christ, the source of eternal life. The source and power of that complete gift of self, which Jesus, according to the testimony handed on by Paul, commands us to commemorate in liturgy and in life. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11.26 With God all things are possible. The conclusion of Jesus' conversation with the rich young man is very poignant. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. Not only the rich man, but the disciples themselves are taken aback by Jesus' call to discipleship, the, de the demands of which transcend human aspirations and abilities. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But the Master refers them to God's power. With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The same chapter in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus, interpreting the Mosaic Law on marriage, rejects the right to divorce, appealing to a beginning more fundamental and more authoritative than the law of Moses. God's original plan for mankind, a plan for which man, after sin, has no longer been able to live up to. For your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Jesus' appeal to the beginning dismays the disciples who remark, If this is the case of a man with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. In Jesus, referring specifically to the charism of celibacy for the kingdom of heaven, but stating a general rule, indicating the new and surprising possibility opened up to man by God's grace. He said to them, Not everyone can accept this saying, but only those to whom it is given. To imitate and live out the love of Christ is not possible for man by his own strength alone. He becomes capable of this love only by virtue of a gift received. As the Lord Jesus receives the love of his Father, so he in turn freely communicates that love to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. John 15.9 Christ's gift is his Spirit whose first fruit is charity. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. St. Augustine asks, Does love bring about the keeping of the commandments, or does keeping the commandments bring about love? And he answers, But who can doubt that love comes first? For the one who does not love has no reason for keeping the commandments. The law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8.2 With these words the Apostle Paul invites us to consider in the perspective of the history of salvation, which reaches its fulfillment in Christ, the relationship between the old law and grace, the new law. He recognizes the pedagogic function of the law by which, enabling a sinful man to take stock of his own powerlessness 
and by stripping him of the presumption of his self-sufficiency, leads him to ask for and to receive life in the Spirit. Only in this new life is it possible to carry out God's commandments. Indeed, it is through faith in Christ that we have been made righteous. The righteousness which the law demands, but is unable to give, is found by every believer to be revealed and granted by the Lord Jesus. Once again it is St. Augustine who admirably sums up this Pauline dialectic of law and grace. The law was given that grace might be sought, and grace was given that the law might be fulfilled. Love and life, according to the Gospel, cannot be thought of first and foremost as a kind of precept, because what they demand is beyond man's abilities. They are possible only as the result of a gift of God who heals, restores, and transforms the human heart by His grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 1.17 17. The promise of eternal life is thus linked to the gift of grace, and the gift of the Spirit which we have received is even now the guarantee of our inheritance. And so we find revealed the authentic and original aspect of the commandment of love and of the perfection to which it is ordered. We are speaking of a possibility opened up to man exclusively by grace, by the gift of God, by his love. On the other hand, precisely the awareness of having received this gift, of possessing in Christ Jesus the love of God, generates and sustains the free response of a full love for God and the brethren. As the Apostle John insistently reminds us in his first letter, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for love, for God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 7, 8, 11, 19 This inseparable connection between the Lord's grace and human freedom, between the gift and task, has been expressed in simple yet profound words by St. Augustine in his prayer. Da quod iubis et iubi quod vis Grant what you command, and command what you will. The gift does not lessen, but reinforces the moral demands of love. This is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. One can abide in love only by keeping the commandments, as Jesus states, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. John 15.10 Going to the heart of the moral message of Jesus and the preaching of the apostles, and summing up in a remarkable way the great tradition of the fathers of East and West, and of St. Augustine in particular, St. Thomas was able to write that the new law is the grace of the Holy Spirit given through faith in Christ. The external precepts also mentioned in the Gospel dispose one for this grace and produce its effects in one life. Indeed, the new law is not content to say what must be done, but also gives the power to do what is true. 
John 3.21. St. John Chrysostom likewise observed that the new law was promulgated at the descent of the Holy Spirit from heaven on the day of Pentecost, and that the apostles did not come down from the mountain carrying, like Moses, tablets of stone in their hands, but they came down carrying the Holy Spirit in their hearts, having become by His grace a living law, a living book. Lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Jesus' conversation with the rich young man continues, in a sense, in every period of history, including our own. The question, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life, arises in the heart of every individual, and it is Christ alone who is capable of giving the full and definitive answer. The teacher who expounds God's commandments who invites others to follow him and give the grace for a new life, is always present and at work in our midst. As he himself promised, Lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Matthew 28.20 20. Christ's revelance for the church of all times is shown forth in his body, which is the church. For this reason the Lord promised his disciples the Holy Spirit, who would bring to their remembrance and teach them to understand his commandments, and who would be the principal and constant source of a new life in the world. The moral prescriptions which God imparted in the Old Covenant which attained their perfection in the new and eternal covenant, in the very person of the Son of God, made man, must be faithfully kept and continually put into practice in the various different cultures throughout the course of history. The task of interpreting these prescriptions was entrusted by Jesus to the apostles and to their successors, with the special assistance of the Spirit of Truth. He who hears you, hears me. Luke 10.16 By the light and the strength of this Spirit, the apostles carried out their mission of preaching the gospel and of pointing out the way of the Lord. See Acts 18.25 Teaching above all how to follow in it and imitate Christ, for to me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 In the moral catechesis of the apostles, besides exhortations and directions connected to the specific historical and cultural situations, we find an ethical teaching with precise rules of behavior. This is seen in their letters, which contain the interpretation, made under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of the Lord's precepts as they are to be lived in different cultural circumstances. From the Church's beginnings, the Apostles, by virtue of their pastoral responsibility to preach the Gospel, were vigilant over the right conduct of Christians just as they were vigilant for the purity of the faith and the handing down of the divine gifts and the sacraments, the first Christians, coming both from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, differed from the pagans not only in their faith and their liturgy, but also in the witness of their moral conduct, which was inspired by the new law. The Church is, in fact, a communion of both faith and of life, her rule of life is faith working through love. Galatians 5.6 
No damage must be done to the harmony between faith and life. The unity of the church is damaged not only by Christians who reject or distort the truths of faith, but also by those who disregard the moral obligations to which they are called by the gospel. The apostles decisively rejected any separation between the commitment of the heart and the action which express or prove it. And ever since apostolic times the church's pastors have unambiguously condemned the behavior of those who fostered divisions by the teaching of their actions. Within the unity of the church, promoting and preserving the faith and the moral life is the task entrusted by Jesus to the apostles, a task which continues in the ministry of their successors. This is apparent from the living tradition whereby as the Second Vatican Council teaches, the Church, in her teaching, life, and worship, perpetuates and hands on to every generation all that she is and all that she believes. This tradition, which comes from the Apostles, progresses in the Church under the assistance of the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit the Church receives and hands down the Scripture as the witness to the great things which God has done in history. She professes by the lips of her fathers and doctors the truth of the Word made flesh, puts his precepts and love into practice in the lives of her saints and in the sacrifice of her martyrs, and celebrates her hope in him in the liturgy. By the same tradition, Christians receive the living voice of the gospel as the faithful expression of God's wisdom and will. Within tradition, the authentic interpretation of the Lord's law develops with the help of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who is at the origin of the revelation of Jesus' commandments and teaching guarantee that they will be reverently preserved, faithfully expounded and correctly applied in different times and places. This constant putting into practice of the commandments is the sign and fruit of a deeper insight into revelation and of an understanding and the light of faith of new historical and cultural situations. Nevertheless, it can only confirm the permanent validity of revelation and follow in the line of the interpretation given to it by the great tradition of the Church's teaching in life, as witnessed by the teachings of the Fathers, the lives of the Saints, the Church's liturgy, and the teaching of the Magisterium. In particular, as the Council affirms, the task of authentically interpreting the Word of God, whether in its written form or in that of tradition, has been entrusted only to those charged with the Church's living magisterium, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. The Church, in her life and teaching, is thus revealed as the pillar and bulwark of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 including the truth regarding moral action. Indeed, the Church has the right always and everywhere to proclaim moral principles, even in respect of the social order, and to make judgments about any human matter in so far as this is required by the fundamental human rights or the salvation of souls. Precisely on the questions frequently debated in moral theology today, and with regard to which new tendencies and theories have developed, the magisterium, in fidelity to Jesus Christ and in continuity with the Church's tradition, senses more urge urgently the duty to offer its own discernment and teaching in order to help man in his journey towards truth and freedom.
Chapter 2 Do not be conformed to this world. Romans 12, 2 The Church and the Discernment of Certain Tendencies in Present-Day Moral Theology Teaching What Befits Sound Doctrine Titus 2.1 Our meditation on the dialogue between Jesus and the rich young man has enabled us to bring together the essential elements of revelation in the Old and New Testament with regard to moral action. These are the subordination of man and his activity to God, the one who alone is good, the relationship clearly indicated in the divine commandments between the moral good of human acts and eternal life, Christian discipleship, which opens up before man the perspective of perfect love, and finally the gift of the Holy Spirit, source and means of the moral life of the new creation. In her reflection on morality, the Church has always kept in mind the words of Jesus to the rich young man. Indeed, sacred scripture remains the living and fruitful source of the Church's moral doctrine. As the Second Vatican Council recalled, the Gospel is the source of all saving truth and moral teaching. The Church has faithfully preserved what the Word of God teaches not only about truths which must be believed, but also about moral action, action pleasing to God. She has achieved a doctrinal development analogous to that which has taken place in the realm of the truths of faith. Assisted by the Holy Spirit who leads her into all the truth, the Church has not ceased nor can she ever cease to contemplate the mystery of the Word incarnate in whom the light is shed on the mystery of man. The Church's moral reflection, always conducted in the light of Christ, the Good Teacher, has also developed in the specific form of the theological science called moral theology a science which accepts and examines divine revelation while at the same time responding to the demands of human reason. Moral theology is a reflection concerning, concerned with morality, with the good and the evil of human acts, and of the person who performs them. In this sense, it is accessible to all people, but it is also theology inasmuch as it acknowledges that the origin and the end of moral action are found in the one who alone is good and who by giving himself to man in Christ offers him the happiness of divine life. The Second Vatican Council invited scholars to take special care for the renewal of moral theology in such a way that its scientific presentation, increasingly based on the teaching of Scripture, will cast light on the exalted vocation of the faithful in Christ and on their obligation to bear fruit in charity for the life of the world. The Council also encouraged theologians, while respecting the methods and requirements of theological science, to look for a more appropriate way of communicating doctrine to the people of their time, since there is a difference between the deposit or the truths of faith and the manner in which they are expressed, keeping the same meaning and the same judgment. This led to a further invitation, one extended to all the faithful, but addressed to theologians in particular, the faith should live in the closest contact with others of their time, and should work for a perfect understanding of their modes of thought and feelings as expressed in their culture. 
The work of many theologians who found support in the Council's encouragement has already borne fruit in the interesting and helpful reflections about the truths of faith to be believed and applied in life, reflections offered in a form better suited to the sensitivities and questions of our contemporaries. The Church, and particularly the bishops, to whom Jesus Christ primarily entrusted the ministry of teaching, are deeply appreciative of this work and encourage theologians to continue their efforts, inspired by that profound and authentic fear of the Lord which is the beginning of wisdom. At the same time, however, within the context of the theological debates which followed the Council, there have developed certain interpretations of Christian morality which are not consistent with the sound teaching. 2 Timothy 4.3 Certainly the Church's magisterium does not intend to impose upon the faithful any particular theological system, still less a philosophical one. Nevertheless, in order to reverently preserve and faithfully expound the word of God, the magisterium has the duty to state that some trends of theological thinking and certain philosophical affirmations are incompatible with revealed truth. In addressing this encyclical to you, my brother bishops, it is my intention to state the principles necessary for discerning what is contrary to sound doctrine, drawing attention to those elements of the Church's moral teaching which today appear particularly exposed to error, ambiguity, or neglect. Yet there are the very elements on which there depends the answer to the obscure riddles of the human condition which also today, as in the past, profoundly disturbed the human heart. What is man? What is the meaning and purpose of our life? What is good and what is sin? What origin and purpose do sufferings have? What is the way to attaining true happiness? What are death, judgment, and retribution after death? Lastly, what is that final, unutterable mystery which embraces our lives and from which we take our origin and towards which we tend? These and other questions such as, what is freedom and what is its relationship to the truth contained in God's law? What is the role of conscience in man's moral development? How do we determine in accordance with the truth about the good, the specific rights and duties of the human person, can all be summed up in the fundamental questions which the young man in the gospel put to Jesus, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Because the church has been sent by Jesus to preach the gospel, and to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all, that he has commanded, she today once more puts, it, puts forward the master's reply. A reply possesses a light and a power capable of answering even the most controversial and complex questions. This light and power also impels the Church constantly to carry out not only her dogmatic, but also her moral reflection within an interdisciplinary context, which is especially necessary when facing new issues. It is in the same light and power that the Church's magisterium continues to carry out its task of discernment, accepting and living out the admonition addressed by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season, convince, 
rebuke and exhort. Be unfailing in patience and in teaching. For the time will come when people will have not, will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their liking and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be steady, endure suffering, to do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5 You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8.32 The human issues most frequently debated and differently resolved in the contemporary moral reflection are all closely related, albeit in various ways, to a critical issue, human freedom. Certainly people today have a particularly strong sense of freedom. As the Council's Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, had already observed, the dignity of the human person is a concern of which people in our time are becoming increasingly more aware. Hence the insistent demand that people be permitted to enjoy the use of their own responsible judgment and freedom and decide on their actions on grounds of duty and conscience without external pressure or, or coercion. In particular, the right to religious freedom and to respect for conscience on its journey towards the truth is increasingly perceived as the foundation of the cumulative rights of the person. This heightened sense of the dignity of the human person and of his or her uniqueness and of the respect due to the journey of conscience perhaps represents one of the positive achievements of modern culture. This perception authentic as it is, has been expressed in a number of more or less adequate ways, some of which, however, diverge from the truth about man as a creature and the image of God, and thus need to be corrected and purified in the light of faith. Certain currents of modern thought have gone so far as to exalt freedom to such an extent that it becomes an absolute which would then be the source of values. This is the direction taken by doctrines which have lost the sense of the transcendent, or which are explicitly atheist. The individual conscience is accorded the status of a supreme tribunal of moral judgment, which hands down the categorical and infallible decisions about good and evil. To the affirmation that one has a duty to follow one's conscience is unduly added the affirmation that one's moral judgment is true merely by the fact that it has its origin in the conscience. But in the way the inescapable claims of truth disappear, yielding their place to a criterion of sincerity, authenticity, and being at peace with oneself, so much so that some have come to adopt a radically subjectivistic conception of moral judgment. As is immediately evident, the crisis of truth is not unconnected with this development. Once the idea of a universal truth about the good know knowable by human reason is lost, Inevitably, the notion of conscience also changes. Conscience is no longer considered in its primordial reality as an act of a person's intelligence, the function of which to apply the universal knowledge of the good in a specific situation, and thus to express a judgment about the right conduct to be chosen here and now. 
Instead, there is a tendency to grant to the individual conscience the prerogative of independently determining the criteria of good and evil and then acting accordingly. Such an outlook is quite congenial to an individualist ethic, wherein each individual is faced with his own truth, different from the truth of others. Taken to its extreme consequences, this individualism leads to a denial of the very idea of human nature. These different notions are at the origin of currents of thought which posit a radical op opposition between the moral law and conscience, between nature and freedom. Side by side with its exaltation of freedom, yet oddly in contrast with it, modern culture radically questions the very existence of this freedom. A number of disciplines, grouped under the name of behavioral sciences, have rightly drawn attention to the many kinds of psychological and social conditioning which influence the exercise of human freedom. Knowledge of these conditionings and the study they have received represent important achievements which have found application in various areas. For example, in pedagogy or the administration of justice. But some people, going beyond the conclusions which can be legitimately drawn from these observations, have come to question or even deny the very reality of human freedom. Mention should also be made here of the theories which mis misuse scientific research about the human person. Arguing from the great variety of customs, behavior patterns, and institutions present in humanity, these theories end up, if not with an outright denial of universal human values, at least with a relativistic conception of morality. Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? The question of morality, to which Christ provides the answer, cannot prescind from the issue of freedom. Indeed, it considers that issue central, for there can be no morality without freedom. It is only in freedom that man can turn to what is good. But what sort of freedom? The Council, considering our contemporaries who highly regard freedom and assiduously pursue it, but who often cultivate it in wrong ways as a license to do anything they please, even evil, speaks of a genuine freedom. Genuine freedom is an outstanding manifestation of the divine image of man. For God willed to leave man in the power of his own counsel, so that he would seek his creator of his own accord, and would freely arrive at full and blessed perfection by cleaving to God. Although each individual has a right to be respected in his own journey in the search of truth, there exists a prior moral obligation, and a grave one at that, to seek the truth and to adhere to it once it is known. As Cardinal John Henry Newman, that outstanding defender of the rights of conscience, forcefully put it, conscience has rights because it has duties. Certain tendencies in contemporary moral theology under the influence of the currents of subjectivism and individualism just mentioned, involved novel interpretations of the relationship of freedom to the moral law, human nature and conscience, and proposed novel criteria for the moral evaluation of acts. Despite their variety, these tendencies are at one in lessening or even denying the dependence of freedom on truth. If we wish to undertake a critical discernment of these tendencies, a, di 
A discernment capable of acknowledging what is legitimate, useful, and of value in them, while at the same time pointing out their ambiguities, dangers, and errors, we must examine them in the light of the fundamental dependence of freedom upon truth, a dependence which has found its clearest and most authoritative expression in the words of Christ. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free.